And I'm, I'm Marilyn Ostergren. Um, I've been working with the sustainability office since it started at a time when I was a student. I was an old student, but I was a student. And uh, I'm very excited about this because, I mean, as a student, I immediately started trying to figure out what was happening around sustainability and wanting there to be ways to get informed and involved. So I'm very excited that that's happening. And I'm very appreciative to David because I've been sort of poking at this conversation for a long time and things have been happening painfully slowly. And now they're picking up speed considerably. So excited about this. Awesome, thanks Marilyn. Uh, okay, so there's a, there's a whole bunch of people in the room and there's a whole bunch of people online. Um, what do we, do we want to have everyone introduce themselves or I'm worried that might take like an extended period of time. Uh, what are, what are our thoughts? Dave, I would say, why don't you go through your, your presentation first and take questions and then if we'll see how much time we have at the end, it, it would be great to get to know everybody, but, um, yeah. but just for the sake of time and knowing that it'll be five o'clock sooner than later, uh, I think you ought to go through what you have if people okay. are okay with that. Yeah, and as folks have questions, they can introduce themselves, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, <laughs> I will allow for questions during the presentation, uh, but I'll just put the qualifier on it. There's no way I'll get it done in 10 minutes with you asking questions in the middle, but that's okay. As long as everyone understands why it takes a little bit longer. Um, uh, all right, so, uh, uh, let's uh, jump to uh, the next slide. Oh, first of all, has it, how many people have actually seen this already or seen a version of this? Uh, I got one hand. No, everybody see, of course. Okay, all right, cool. Uh, let's jump into this. Uh, okay, so you a uh, couple of neat little diagrams, uh, and I'll just highlight that uh, all the charts that are exciting and actually have like cool graphics on it uh, came from Maryland, and all the ones with boring words. Uh, are mine. Uh, so they're very easy to tell the difference. Uh, all right, so number one, this is just a context thing of making people understand how most of the buildings on our campus get heated, right? So we we burn natural gas. We used to burn coal up to like 1988. We burned coal at our steam plant uh, to produce steam. Uh, and then that steam gets distributed, natural gas, now we're burning the natural gas to produce steam. A steam gets distributed through pipes around our campus in our infamous tunnel system, which is awesome. Uh, and that steam gets to buildings. And then most of the buildings have their own secondary heating water loop. And that heating water loop gets heated in the mechanical room uh, through a heat exchange process where the heat leaves the steam and goes to the, the hot water. But the, the problem uh, for us is that that natural gas that we're burning to produce that steam is a fossil fuel, as I'm sure all of you know. Uh, and that's like 93% of UW's scope one, scope two emissions comes from that natural gas that we burn. So if if the University of Washington is gonna do something significant to reduce its scope one, scope two emissions, it has to radically change the way in which it heats its buildings. Uh, that's kind of like, like that's the like big takeaway. Uh, and this is just kind of the starting point of that slide uh, around uh, what presently happens. All right, next slide. I got nine minutes left. Uh, hey, not only do we heat the buildings from the steam plant, we also cool the buildings from the steam plant. And right now, these are two separate systems. And I'll just highlight that you know, cooling, in a way, is just another form of heating. And what I mean by that is when we send cold, so we have chillers at the power plant that produce cold water, we send that cold water out to the buildings, and we extract the heat from the buildings, you know, no different than your fridge. Right, which has the, the box in the box, you're extracting the cold air from the box part of your fridge, and then it's dissipating that heat through the radiators on the coil on the back, and that heat goes into the air in your kitchen. Uh, so here we extract the heat from the buildings and that warm water that comes back to the power plant, we take that waste heat and we dump it to the atmosphere via cooling towers. How many people? Run along, walk along Berkeley Island Trail, heard the sounds of the water falling as you go by the plant. 
those are cooling towers, right? They're really quiet this time of year because I think we got one left that's running because uh, there's not much cooling happening anymore on the campus. Uh, but anytime in the fall, spring, the summer, it's quite loud that you'd hear that. Uh, but we're just taking that waste heat and dumping it to the air. And, and that's because the temperature of the steam system is too hot. And the big opportunity is to replace that high temperature steam system with a lower temperature hot water system. And then we could use uh, heat pumps that exist today uh, to reclaim that waste heat that we would otherwise be dumping into the atmosphere and, and use it as a first source of heating our buildings uh, and displace uh, natural gas. All right, next slide. I know I've jumped way ahead, but those two slides kind of forced that conversation. All right. Uh, yeah, so those heating and cooling systems have served us well, uh, but now there's an opportunity to you know, rethink how these systems work and how they could work uh, and interact uh, together. Next slide. All right, four big challenges that we have. Number one, I already spoke to that our greenhouse gas emissions uh, come from the, the steam plant, 93%. Uh, the second is uh, our buildings aren't as efficient as they could be by like a factor of two overall on the campus. Uh, and so um, that represents an opportunity to make better use of the energy that we uh, consume within our buildings. Uh, but uh, uh, it also means we're offsides with uh, the, like the Washington State Clean Buildings performance standard and the uh, uh, standards coming out of the city as well, or legislation coming out of the city. Uh, third one is also really important. So I mentioned that we could use uh, modern day heat pumps as a way to reclaim the waste heat from the cooling towers. Well, those heat pumps use electricity. And so in essence, what, what we're talking about and some of the other ideas that I'm gonna present are really fuel switch uh, pieces. So instead of, using natural gas, we're using electricity. But because of this third piece that we're, you know, we get all our electricity comes from Seattle City Light. Uh, it's 100% clean, which is awesome, but we're constrained by the capacity that we have from them. So we need to be as efficient as we possibly can with our electricity, especially in the context, knowing that we're about to do this big fuel switch, uh, which is gonna increase our use of electricity. So kind of the point before about we're not as energy efficient, so we need to be energy efficient, make the best use of our electricity um, so that we can make this transformation and work within the, the third constraint. I'd also add that uh, uh, the fuel switch is from natural gas that we use to burn, uh, to create steam, to using electricity to run heat pumps. Uh, and I'll explain two other ways. I described the cooling tower where I'm lifting that, that low grade heat that we dissipate to the atmosphere from the heat pumps uh, or from the cooling towers. Um, we, instead of putting that heat to the, to the air, we put the heat into the hot water system, displacing natural gas. So that's why that's a fuel switch. Um, uh, the other really big concern is cooling, right? So with you know climate change also means climate adaptation. And one of the effects on us in the Pacific Northwest is we're, we're used to having a pretty mild, nice climate. You know, hot summer's not too hot, just bright. And we could design buildings with passive house techniques and free cooling, openable windows, uh, this type of thing. And, you know, but it, uh, not anymore. Uh, I mean, we still have those features, but in order to make the spaces functional for uh, all through the summer, um, and as the summer start to get extended, right? Like, what did we have? A record for the number of days over 80 degrees in October and September this year. Uh, I think we were one day away from most days over 90 degrees um, as well. So uh, all of that's been a driver for cooling and mechanical cooling in our buildings. Uh, and that's, you know, mechanical cooling comes from using more electricity. Um, even if we use it in the most efficient way possible, it's still more than we were using before. And our peak electrical use happens uh, on the summer. So this summer when it was 94 degrees at the end of July, uh, that was our peak electrical consumption day. All right, uh, last one is aging utility infrastructure, which is 
hey, our infrastructure is getting uh, old and we got to invest, reinvest it in, in it anyway. So why not invest in a way that addresses the first three points on this list? Okay, next slide. Uh, all right. So uh, this is a chart that we've been using to a certain degree, kind of has the whole story uh, in a nutshell right here. Number one, these are the four issues that I just described in detail. Uh, and this is the goals that we have with each one, like reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 100%, significant reduction in our energy use, uh, accommodate, and oh, Marilyn, you're doing awesome with the arrow because that's what I was doing on my screen, realized, okay, no one can actually see me moving my arrow down there. That's great, uh, right? Address the capacity constraint. And you know what? Uh, we're a research powerhouse university. So this infrastructure actually has to work, right? And it needs to be resilient. We need power that we can rely on. We need, you know, temperatures in the spaces so that you guys can actually function as students. Uh, and so, and also so that the research activities can happen and not be uh, interrupted because it's too cold or it's too hot or that there's no power. Uh, all right, uh, click through. All right, next one. Okay, so, so five elements to the strategy. Uh, first part's all about energy efficiency. Uh, you know, I spoke to the fact of we're needing a significant reduction on the energy efficiency part. Uh, well, we have four parts in this part of the plan. One is uh, expand metering. There's a great program eight, nine years ago putting, um, you know, smart meters in all the buildings. Uh, did most of the buildings, but we need to finish that project off. Uh, there's around 60 some odd buildings that uh, don't have thermal meters on them. And so we, uh, we can't fully measure how those, well, we can't measure how those buildings are performing. Um, so that's first, finish that metering program. Second is upgrade controls. Uh, most of our buildings are on digital controls, but we still have around 40 buildings that are not, that are on pneumatic controls. I can explain that in detail if you like, but I'll park that one for now, it just speeds up some time. Point is we need to upgrade all of our buildings to digital controls. I think everyone would understand that digital means that we'll have access to the data and that the pneumatic controls, we don't have access to the data. And that's why we want them all to be digital so that we can capture all of this data information across our entire campus, uh, which gets to the third part, which is data analytics. There are really, really powerful tools, uh, some AI based stuff that exists out there uh, that allows us to uh, uh, have our buildings perform uh, better. Uh, and uh, everything from finding things like where you have simultaneous heating and cooling, where we may not even know it, but that the uh, curiosity, what percentage of camp is still running? Uh, it's about 20%, 25%, just trying to do the math uh, quickly. Um, yeah, 20%, I'm apparently not. Uh, all right, and then, so data analytics is a big play from the standpoint of improving our ability to find where our energy is being wasted on campus. Uh, when I left UBC, we had all of our, the buildings on our data analytics platform. Uh, here at the moment, we have six. Uh, so we got a long uh, hill to climb to get there. Uh, and that, that may take us up to five years to get all of that data mapped over. Uh, the fourth uh, piece is this uh, green revolving fund concept. And this is basically saying when you spend half a billion dollars a year right now on energy conservation efforts, we want to increase that by $3 million. Uh, the plan is to, which we've started, is to uh, have the first two years worth of projects be uh, projects with a quick payback or quick turnaround. So two year or less payback. And the significance of that is that then you can use the energy savings by the third year of this program. Well, that combined with the rebates that you're getting from the initial should the slide be on number four now. Oh, no, no, we're still on number one. Uh, if you look at the top where it says energy efficiency, it says uh, expand metering, upgrade controls, data analytics, and green revolving funds. So these are the these are the four things that I fit in this one column because they're all related to energy efficiency. Um, and so back to the Green Revolving Fund, it's uh, the idea is to make the fund self-sustaining by the third year. So the university doesn't have to come up with $3 million every year. We just use the energy savings and the rebates that we got from the projects in the first two years to fund the future year's uh, projects. Um, and, and you see the effect 
uh, that you know, fifteen percent reduction. That's over ten years, uh, and then a thirty percent reduction on energy consumption over uh, ten years. Uh, all right, thanks, Adam. No worries. Okay, we're ready for the next uh, part. So, part two. Uh, so, one part one was making our buildings more energy efficient. Number two is the conversion to hot water, and this is really the linchpin, right? So, I was describing about reclaiming that the waste heat from the cooling towers. Well, uh, we can't do that with the steam system because it's too hot. Um, and so we need a, a distribution mechanism where the temperature is lower. Uh, and this is the big project that we did when I was at UBC. We converted the campus steam distribution system to hot water. And this is really kind of the fundamental, uh, everything else that I'm gonna talk about to the right uh, is dependent upon column number two uh, happening. Uh, and it, yep, there's there's a, there's an energy benefit related to this uh, based on the distribution losses that we get in the steam system uh, in the steam tunnel. But really, it, the it's uh, it, almost somewhat unfair to only associate the twenty percent uh, reduction with its initiative because it it enables everything else that I'm going to talk about. All right, uh, next column: uh, central cooling and consolidating that cooling. So. I mentioned that the university has a central cooling system. Uh, we also have a lot of chillers that are distributed on the campus itself. Matter of fact, we have just as much weighted capacity of chillers distributed on the campus as we do in the two uh, plants uh, that we have. And so the opportunity here is to, uh, one, uh, the chillers that we have at the two plants run more efficiently than all of the chillers that are distributed on the campus. And that's because of the size and the fact that they can load up uh, on them. The, and so that's significant, right? Because we have to be efficient with the electricity that we use. So having distributed chillers isn't helping with that. Um, so the plan is to consolidate. As those chillers reach the end of their life, uh, we uh, connect those buildings to the central plant. And then the other benefit of connecting to the central plant is now all of that waste heat from the cooling process is now coming back to those uh, to the two central plants that we have, uh, and we can reclaim that as waste heat, once again displacing natural gas. Now, the one limitation of doing this is that you know you think about uh, when do we need cooling, uh, right? We need it in the summertime when we don't need as much heat. We still need some heat, right? Domestic hot water, washing your hands at the sink—that's all coming from the steam that's coming from the power plant right now. So um, you still need some heat, but you don't need the, the biggest volume of heat associated with that. And, the, and conversely, in the middle of winter, uh, you don't have the same cooling demand. We have some cooling demand, but we don't have the same scale of cooling demand that you have in the summer. And so uh, there's not really a congruence between using waste heat from the cooling towers and, and using it for uh, heating uh, the campus. But it works awesome. Uh, in the spring and the fall, in the shoulder seasons. Um, so, but what do we do for summer and winter? And this gets into column number four, which is really, so next one, which really has three pieces to it. One is, uh, well, where are the other sources of waste heat that we could tap into that using that same heat pump technology that we're proposing for the cooling towers? Um, and one is uh, the sanitary sewer. So uh, the two plants that we have, this is where we need to have a map of the campus, Marilyn. Uh, the two plants that we have um, uh, are actually right adjacent to uh, where the sewer lines are, uh, the regional sewer lines from King County. And, and that sewer has pretty much the same temperature through the year. It's about a 13 degree Fahrenheit uh, variance uh, in the temperature across the seasons. But that's okay. That's, that's more than enough uh, that we can use a heat pump to recover the waste heat uh, that's available in those sewers. And that could help in the context of the shoulder seasons. Uh, what are the plans using solar PV canopies, ELOTs? Ah, I'll, I shall come to that, Christoph. Um, hold, off, hold off on that question. Sorry, uh, for later. <laughs> yeah, you bet, you bet. Um, so uh, we can, it's definitely part of the plan. Uh, the, uh, uh, 
So I can use the heat pumps in the same way that I use it for the waste heat from the cooling towers. I can use it for the waste heat from the sewers. Uh, the, the second part is around sort of thermal storage and uh, for cooling and for heating. So in the cooling case, I can, in the summertime, when I have, that's what my peak electrical use is for cooling. What I, but that happens, that peak is happening like at four o'clock, five o'clock in the, in the evening. I can actually turn around and consume electricity in the middle of the night uh, where I'm not at my peak electrical use uh, and uh, produce cold water, put it into storage uh, overnight and then use it when I reach those peak periods during the day and shift that need to use as much electricity and those uh, peak cooling periods. So that's like cooling storage. Similarly, heating storage, uh, you can use it to uh, uh, store the heat. Uh, you know, a lot of those days, especially shoulder seasons where, you know, it's kind of cold in the morning for two, three hours, but then the sun comes out uh, at midday and it's a nice uh, sunny, uh, warm day after that. Uh, you can use thermal storage as a balance in those uh, shoulder seasons. The last part that's in this column is this idea around is the electrical capacity constraint on UW. It's on the Seattle City Light side, uh, but it could very easily become on our side next. So it's a great question because you got to watch where the constraints go. But right now it's on the Seattle City Light side uh, to us. Uh, the, uh, the last part of this electrify heating piece is this idea of using uh, the lake, uh, Lake Washington, both as uh, uh, pulling cold water from a deep part of the lake in the winter. Uh, similarly, you know, the lake temperatures in the deep part of the lake are pretty constant. There's like a two or three degree Fahrenheit variance. I highlight that. Any engineers in the room, uh, the, the shorter the variance of the temperature of the water source, the more efficient the heat pump uh, will be. And by efficient, I mean better use of electricity, greater coefficient of performance. So for every one unit of energy you're putting in, how many units of energy do you get out? And preferably we want more than three when we're using a heat pump. And given our electrical constraints, it's really important that we have that be as efficient as possible. So the lake is by far the best opportunity for that uh, from not just a heating standpoint, but also from a cooling standpoint. And what's also intriguing about the lake, so we could pull cold water up from the lake, use it for cooling on the campus, uh, return uh, warmer water than we pulled from the lake into the shipping canal, but the water would be at a temperature that is much lower than what the shipping ship canal is today. Marilyn, I keep doing that. I keep calling the shipping canal and it's the ship canal, um, the, uh, as Marilyn tells me. Um, the important part about this is that the ship canal today is getting too hot in the summertime and is uh, a barrier for migrating salmon uh, going back to their spawning grounds. Uh, matter of fact, it's got so bad uh, of the temperatures getting up to lethal levels for the salmon that there are you know, nonprofit organizations working together to uh, scoop up the salmon at the Ballard Locks and truck them uh, to their uh, final destination. Um, so it's um, uh, so the idea for us is that we would use the cold water on campus and then we return uh, the cold water to the ship canal. Uh, lowering the temperature of the ship canal and improve conditions for migrating salmon. Now, not to say that we would be solving the whole migrating salmon issue, uh, but it would be uh, a betterment uh, to salmon. At least that's what our hope is in the context of that idea. Um, all right, now I'm noticing that there's a whole bunch of questions that I haven't responded to, or maybe I have. But oh, do any of these projects have to qualify for subsidies on the IRA? Uh, we believe so. We are actively working with our federal liaisons to do so. Up until about two weeks ago, we were of the impression that we actually didn't qualify for IRA funding because of some rule that because we're, uh, it's called instrumentality of the state, uh, that some context of state agencies not having access to uh, federal funding, depending on how the rules are laid out. And that was originally what people thought. Um, that is no longer, we've, we're over the impression that is no longer the case, and at least some of the elements of the IRA funding we would qualify for. We are actively trying to, that's a great question though, 
We were actively working on that. Because uh, I haven't even got to how much all this is, uh, how much finance we, we need to do uh, with all these activities, but I will. Um, all right, uh, back to the lake. Did I cover everything? We lower the temperature of the ship canal, betterment for the fish, uh, betterment for the salmon. Um, and it also helps uh, both from a summertime operation and from a wintertime operation. Uh, in winter, it acts in the same way that we are uh, you know, basically displacing natural gas uh, with the electrical use of the heat pumps. There's also some electrical use of the water pumps to bring uh, water out of the lake. Uh, but uh, relative to uh, just using straight mechanical cooling for our electrical needs, uh, we would be way better to utilize the lake. I see questions, is that Brett? Yes. Um, I'll look at someone else. Oh, no. Um, Wait, do we have. Mute yourself. Everyone mute yourself if you're on. If you're on. <laughs> Are you also on your Zoom? I'm yeah, there was an echo. Give myself a second. Is there an echo? Yeah, still an echo. Is everyone muted in the room? Yeah. Check, check, Brett. I'm not on. So. I think we're good now. All right, cool. Um, so that 45% reduction in GHGs and 15% reduction in energy. When we do those heat pumps in the lake, is that pushing them as much as we can go? Is that relying on a certain funding constraint for how much funding we get for how much heat pumps? Um, what is the, what limitation are we putting on more heat pumps in the lake for more energy right now? Yeah, there's no funding constraint that's holding that 45% piece. It really is about um, just sort of, I mean, and, and look, these are sort of order of magnitude numbers related to uh, when you start to size out how many tons of cooling could you actually pull from the lake uh, given size of pipes. Uh, when comparing to what other agencies have done, like Cornell University and a company called N-Wave out of the city of Toronto, those are the two big examples of deep lake cooling uh, in North America. So, uh, yeah, the you know we may get more out of that. I just didn't. I, I don't think it's realistic to think. I mean, you of, of this. If you if we did a chart that showed our heating load you'll see this massive peak in December, January, February uh, for our season. And so uh, to be able to size equipment from a pragmatic standpoint to get 100% of that, uh, I mean, we'll get to the next chart in a moment. So I'm gonna show that there's still 20% left over, at least from a strategy standpoint. And what I'm saying is that, and we can go to the next part here, Marilyn, is that, I think it's it behooves us from a pragmatic standpoint to really think of a different option for the last 20% as opposed to trying to get all of it in column four. Um, and uh, because as much as I said, we use steam primarily for heating on campuses, the key qualifying word that you might not have picked up on there was primarily. We also use steam for other purposes on the campus. The hospital uses it for process load, sterilization, um, uh, environmental chambers, right? So there's there's uh, uh, dishwashers. There's other use of steam that happens on our campus that, you know, dishwashers maybe not a good one, but the, the autoclaves and the environmental chambers and the, uh, 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 within the hospitals, like that's, that may always be there. And so, we need to figure out a way to, uh, you know, what are the technologies that we can take advantage of that would still allow us to uh, have that, you know, use of steam either on the hottest or sorry, the coldest days of the year, and or for those process loads uh, that we that we may always have on our campus. And what this is highlighting is that that last twenty percent or that final push. Uh, we don't have to. We don't have to pick a winner today on those technologies. There's lots of things that are out there that different folks are working on. Everything from uh, carbon capture uh, to uh, you know nuclear fusion uh, to well, and there's things that actually are very much uh, work today, like renewable natural gas. Um, now, renewable natural gas has with a whole bunch of other policy strings that go with it. Uh, and we can have a 
a big debate on that. We probably should at some point in time. Um, I'm not a big fan of renewable natural gas, but if if someone was asking me to solve the last 20% today, I would point to that as being a technology or an energy source that's available that exists. Uh, but if I've got 10 years to figure out that final 20%, I'd be more curious to watch what happens in the field of carbon capture and what happens uh, with nuclear fusion, uh, because those might become uh, big winners uh, for that final piece. That help, Brett? Yeah, it did. I think my only follow-up question to that would be, and that was a helpful answer, but um, so that 20% that's left over, um, how much of that is energy that needs to be provided to the hospitals, um, excess energy where we need steam? How much of that is the peak heating and cooling? Um, I'm, it's a good question. I don't have the answer for that. It's, it's just a little bit of a blur of both. I mean, there's also this element of just trying to be a little bit uh, smart about what we do with that peak heating uh, requirement. That there is very much a diversification concern that as everybody decarbonizes in the Seattle area, that is going to put massive pressure on the electrical grid not just us. And, and we can, look, we're gonna sit here and try and predict it. We can watch it. This is already happening in places like Massachusetts and in California. And so you can look at what's happening there and it's a really good precursor of what things might be like here in four or five years. And so anyway, it behooves us to kind of still have this option, not for year round, but for those days when the temperature goes into the teens, I, I'm working on my Fahrenheit Celsius there. Uh, normally I would say below zero, uh, but you know when the temperatures get into the teens, just how dependent on electricity do we wanna be when everybody else is dependent on electricity? Thank you. You bet. Okay, next slide. And this kind of, the next two slides are kind of graphically showing timing and depth of impact on the same uh, numbers that you saw in the other chart. So this one, this is greenhouse gas emissions. Our starting point is like, you know, roughly a hundred. I think it's actually like 85,000 is the steam plant itself. Uh, and then showing the effect of especially two energy efficiency tranches, right? So that's doing the same program. Uh, five years, first five years, and the next five years, but then we've we've sandwiched the convert to hot water uh, in between and showing the effect on greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, the big piece that makes a difference on the GHG front is the electrify heating, which is a combination of cooling storage, heating storage, uh, and the uh, sewer play and the uh, lake play, uh, and the uh, cooling towers, right? All three, cooling tower, sewer, and lake. It's the same idea. It's a large district scale heat pump in, in our plants that is then providing that uh, uh, capturing uh, low grade heat from those sources and using that to heat our buildings instead of natural gas. And then the final push of the last 20%. Uh, all right, next slide. Same piece, but now this is focusing on energy. And the column on the left is showing you know, BTUs per gross square foot. Those who are following the energy play, that's just a that's the engineering way of saying the energy use index or EUI is a target. I think you, if you haven't heard or you'll be hearing more of, or for the rest of your life, you'll be hearing more of uh, energy use index and energy use uh, index targets. And so we're, you know, we're around 200 uh, overall average as a campus. That would be fine if every single building on our campus was a high-end research facility, but they are not. Uh, and so our mix, uh, we should actually be at an average more like 100. Uh, that's what the state, 102 is what the state target is that they put out in the Washington State Clean Building Performance Standard. And uh, so this is our plan. Uh, to get us to 100. And you see the energy efficiency plus converting to hot water plus the second energy efficiency tranche uh, gets us there. Uh, 
Um, and the uh, bonus is the, uh, you know, centralizing the cooling efficiency play, and then the uh, final electric heating on the other parts. Um, so, you know, uh, it gets us to like 50, so that's the 75% reduction. That's pretty significant. Um, my boss's reaction when he first saw this chart was, really, do we think we get to 50? Uh, well, the place I left was at 67 when I left. So um, 200 is way too far off the mark. Uh, if we get to 100, that'll be great, but uh, there's no reason why we can't set aspirational targets uh, to numbers as low as 50. Uh, all right, next slide. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, you know, all five elements, but now we're putting a dollar value around it. And, uh, you know, and when you start to add these pieces together, uh, it, you know, it's around, you know, half a billion dollars, $550 million. But I just, you know, I, when I first get, started giving this presentation and I first started throwing numbers into it, um, you know, the, you know, you can well imagine the reaction it gets. Is, oh, wow, like that's a lot. Um, where's that funding gonna come from? Let's just hold just for a moment. Look at column number one, metering, upgrade controls, data analytics, and green revolving funds. Almost everything that's in that has some type of return. Well, obviously the green revolving fund is based on a return on it. Um, and so I would suggest that everything in column number one will pay for itself, okay, meters indirectly. But in essence, for the work that we would do, we would create this. So it's really a cash flow issue on number one of getting the money in the first place. Second, convert to hot water, $250 million. UW had a study done in 2017 that said if the price of carbon was over $25 a ton, converting to hot water would have a positive NPV, or that was the break point towards a positive net present value for those of you in the business school. Uh, and meaning that it's better than the status quo option of doing nothing, right? So, um, you know, at UBC, we self-financed our conversion to hot water through the savings related to the project. Uh, and so what I'm saying, oh, sorry, and just for more context, uh, commerce, uh, sorry, ecology, the state of Washington on the Climate Commitment Act, uh, starting next year, they're going to have auctions and UW has to buy allotments based on its carbon emissions. And the model report that came out in June of this year said the starting price point for those auctions is gonna be around $41 a ton. So $16 higher than what the 2017 report picked as the uh, uh, break even for NPV. So what I'm getting to is I think column number two, although looked over a longer term, so a 30 year period uh, has a return. So once again, it's not a, funding issue, it's a financing issue um, and cash flow uh, and timing of funds. Third, uh, consolidating the cooling. Okay, now the trick here is to say, there's money that we're gonna have to spend on replacing the chillers inside the buildings anyway. So why not take that money and put it towards investing the capacity or increasing the capacity of the main chiller plants being more efficient with electricity and also creating that opportunity for all that waste heat coming back. So uh, is it a positive NPV? Well, it is relative to the money that you would spend anyway. So from a status quo perspective, yes, but once again, you still need the cash, same as this other two. Connor. Yeah, so I'm gonna lob a grenade before I have to jump to another meeting, but yep. you mentioned for both two and three, it's a it's not a funding issue, but a financing issue. Yes. At the end of the day, it is a funding issue, right? How, how do you how do you convince the board of regents, the donors, to invest upfront? Like, I, I'm I'm at the business school. I ask this in every class. Like, how, awesome. do, you, how do you extend the time horizon for for donors to to make it worth it when you're talking? Yeah, it's going to take thirty years to to pay off when everybody is like, it's different for a school, but like this is the equivalent of the quarterly earnings report. Like, totally. How do you message that? Totally, so it's a great, it's an awesome question, Connor. 
Uh, so one of the benefits is we're a university. The University of Washington intends to be here 30 years from now, they intend to be here 50 years from now, they intend to be here 100 years from now. So, uh, so part of the argument that I've made and will continue to make is just that. that so we are a little different because uh, you're right, most private businesses, you know, if you were making a proposal that was beyond a 10 year outlook, uh, you'd be laughed out of the boardroom. Um, so, so that's, that's one of the part of, uh, that's one part of the pitch. Uh, the other part is, you know, uh, and we've been actively doing this, um, um, and that is, you know, once again, like trying to tell the story. A lot of people don't even understand uh, what we presently use natural gas for, uh, or the amount that we buy, uh, or uh, you know that we we don't use coal, or you know the name of the of the plant is the UW power plant, and so they don't know are we producing electricity, are we producing heat? What do we actually do there? And so part of what we're part of what I we uh, so we Marilyn, Lisa, myself have been trying to do is simplify the message of what this change is. Uh, because a lot of people, like when you start talking about half a billion dollars and it gets really complex and really confusing really fast. And if people don't understand the basis in the first place, they're gonna be really reluctant to committing to a, you know, a 15 year strategy where you're spending that kind of money. Um, so, uh, so that's, <laughs> There's a lot to that question, but I'd say, you know, the heart of it is trying to simplify the message so everyone can understand um, the strategy so that as different components come forward, people go, oh yeah, I know why we're doing that, right? Like steam to hot water. I know why we're doing steam to hot water because we can't do anything else to the right unless that's been done first. Uh, but uh, I don't know if I... There's definitely more there, Connor, that I could go deeper into, but I'm gonna hold going deeper as I see we've got Nicholas and then a question from John Kennedy in the chat. Was yeah. there a follow, follow up, Connor, or did I help start the, the, the path for you? No, yeah, I mean that that's what I expected. That's a that's a big question, and I I, I know it was, but I was just curious to see sure. no, it's hey. there was a strategy behind that. So I'm I'm glad to hear there is. Yeah, and it's really good. I mean, the, the, the good news on the funding side, right, is there's different things that are coming available. So, you know, there's potentially 30% to come out of IRA funding. Um, there's, I, I mentioned the Climate Commitment Act from the state. Well, there's a there's an invest side of that Climate Commitment Act. So as much as UW is going to have to buy its allotments through the auction, it's going to have access to the capital that comes out of those auctions. Uh, and that can be a, a funding source for our projects. Uh, as well as, you know, I talked about the Green Revolving Fund being sort of creating this self-sustaining $3 million fund. It also has the ability to build up uh, 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 cash that we could have access to, but would need a policy change at the university. Uh, Nicholas. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I know John Kennedy has a question in the chat and we can get to that too. Uh, it's great to see everybody here. It's nice to say hi to you, David. Uh, Brett was asking some of the questions for me when you and he had coffee a couple of weeks ago now. Okay. Um, but one of my big ones is I, I, a sort of different tact would be instead of sort of taking the electricity deficit as a given, trying to figure out a way to expand like UW's generation of electricity oh. to theoretically replace the natural gas with electricity sooner, right? Has yeah. there been any consideration to whether it was some kind of wind installation, whether it was a large scale solar installation that could be probably not on campus because obviously things are so close, but like could the quote unquote UW power plant be a like large solar array that is far north and then you're like running transmission lines. Like I know it's a little bit of a harder idea. I just wanted to throw it out there. Sure. Uh, so what has been talked about is using the east parking lots uh, for solar panels. So this is so Christoph, I'm getting to your answer now uh, from before using the east campus parking lots. Uh, and I've seen reports that say that's somewhere between five to 10 megawatts of electricity that could be uh, produced there. Now, 
put in context, our present electrical capacity is 54 megawatts. So that's somewhere between you know, 10 to 20 percent of what our present uh, demand is. That's our present demand, right? So our present demand is going to go up as we add more cooling and as we uh, electrify uh, right. our options. So the, the, the unfortunately, the only thing that we could do today that would generate electricity on the scale that what we would need uh, uh, involves making our carbon footprint worse uh, and putting in a cogen plant that would consume natural gas. Now, we're not talking about that. Uh, it's not on our option, but hey, look, if nuclear fusion, uh, which is still in the wishful thinking mode today, but it might not be 10 years from now. And so maybe there's an opportunity uh, there to pivot, not just on the 20% piece, but also on a uh, electrical generation standpoint. I, I, I do highlight, um, I, I cut the slide out of this presentation, but I, I, uh, I have a slide that speaks to sort of uh, goals around all elements of the strategy. And one is around diversification of commodity sources. Because right now we are going down the path where we're going to be 100% dependent on electricity from Seattle City Light. And, and, and as much as they're great and they've provided really nice, reliable power for extended period of time, it's not just them, it's all the people that they're connected to uh, that ultimately will impact us. And we need, we need to keep our eyes uh, on that and not uh, 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 get completely locked in on what. Definitely. Even, even from a pricing standpoint, right? Like, you know, price electricity is, is you know, planned to go up by 11% uh, uh, over the next two years. Uh, yeah. Right? Like that's locked in. That's, that's happening. That's not a waiting for a regulator to decide. Um, all right. Uh, did, uh, did, I, did I get it, Nicholas? Yeah, you sure did. Uh, and go, go for John Kennedy. Okay. Uh, have you done a financing report that illustrates the capital stack and the avoided fines allowing purchases? Uh, I'm working on it, uh, Sean. Literally, as we're, uh, I was doing a report last week that was just focused on what was the financial impact of the two uh, state, uh, the, the two big state legislation that's out there. So the Washington State Clean Performance Standard and the uh, Climate Commitment Act, uh, both have in them, um, you know, in a weird kind of way. So we've positioned with the state, for example, the Washington State Clean Building Performance Standard is, is geared as a building by building approach. And they, the problem with that is that if you have buildings that won't comply, and our initial assessment says the University of Washington will have over 30 buildings that will not comply with the state law, and which is over like 6.6 .6 million square feet of space. And because they don't comply, uh, there's a series, we have to go through what's called an investment criteria pathway, which means we do an ASHRAE level two audit, we do a life cycle cost assessment of all of the energy saving opportunities within the buildings, and if any of those energy savings uh, make sense financially to do, we have to do them. And why that's significant is I will guarantee you that in all 31 of those buildings, when we do that life cycle cost analysis, it will say, uh, put a heat pump inside the building. And we will be forced because of the third part, because it would be financially viable, to put 31 heat pumps in our, in our, on our campus. And I already know today that it'll be way more cost effective to put three large scale heat pumps in our central plant than it is to put 31 smaller heat pumps distributed in the buildings. So what we've, what we've proposed to the state is, look at our strategy, look at our plan. Can our plan count as a compliance pathway? Uh, and they said effectively, yes. They said, look, we'll consider it a conditional compliance uh, pathway. And we'll have to identify, you'll have to report every year and you're gonna have to give sort of milestones of what you're supposed to achieve and what you've done uh, so that we know that you're on track to complete your strategy, but we would accept it. 
And so why that's significant and how that relates back to your question is, oh, okay. So we can avoid spending $30 million every five years following the traditional compliance pathway uh, for that one law by implementing this energy strategy. So that's, that's one piece. The second part is the Climate Commitment Act, which speaks to allowances. So, um, you know, I mentioned, so we're like 93,000 total on the scope one, uh, scope two emissions that are part of the Climate Commitment Act um, rules. Uh, and, and so what they have is they show how the price of carbon is going to increase from you know, starting point somewhere between 41 and 58 next year, rising to somewhere between uh, 60 to uh, 95 by 2030. And then you saw the chart that we have showing our forecasted greenhouse gas emissions going down. So we have the uh, combined effect of the price plus our amount uh, it gives how much we're going to have to buy on allotment allotments. And in there, they do four-year windows. So 2023 to 2026 is the first compliance window. 27 to 30 is the next compliance window. So we so we have that as well. And that's like another uh, 20 plus billion dollars uh, every four years. So these these become pieces. Um, another piece is you know the energy efficiency piece. How much money are we spending too much on an annual basis? to Seattle City Light and Puget Sound Energy because our buildings aren't as efficient as they should be. Order of magnitude, that's around $9 million a year. And that that energy efficiency play, it'll take about 10 years to eliminate that. But that's a that's a $9 million plus. So trying to, I am trying to build up that stack to say, what's the, what's the cash flow that we can generate uh, that would correspond to the timing of the finance, I don't need $550 million tomorrow. Um, I, need it, I need it spread out as we execute the projects over the next 14 years. And so it's a matter of mapping that, uh, what's, what's, what cash do we free up from an operating side that can go as debt servicing against capital um, for all the different component projects. And then throw in lump sum dollars coming from the capital invest program and the IRA and uh, you know wherever else we uh, tap into along the way. I don't have it yet, but I mean that's kind of the uh, imaginations are in in my head. It's very much um, uh, like front and center on my radar of what I'm working on over the next uh, between now and Christmas. Uh, all right. Uh, that John follow up question. Um, well, I mean, you know, as you said, paying for this stuff is going to require an aggregation of, of different funding and financing sources. Right. And, and just how could students be positioned to, you know, pull on those purse strings and widen it? And how could they be used to apply pressure? Um, you know, within the political system at UW in order to get that capital moving more quickly? Well, um, so this is a very dangerous spot for me. What, <laughs> yeah. I, would just, what I would just highlight is that I, I hope the students understand that they have a very powerful voice. Uh, and uh, matter of fact, I would, I would suggest to a certain degree as, as much as I can tell these stories and lay out strategy uh, and create engagement on senior leaders, uh, senior leaders listen to students. And to a certain degree there, your, your voice and your advocacy is stronger than mine. Um, I have a little bit of credibility in the context of where I've come from and what I've done, but, but typically internal staff voices are not, never carry the same weight that students do. Um, and so, you know, part of this exercise is uh, making sure you, all the students are as educated and informed as they possibly possibly could be uh, on this front. But but you guys have a lot of sway. You really do. John, are you, this is Brad from ICI, are you affiliated with, are you affiliated with anyone? Are you here, here to come to the meeting? Um, I'm a, an alum of UW. I now work at a bank doing uh, clean energy and building decarbonization finance, and I run a climate nonprofit. Um, okay. We do a lot of communications and community organizing work. So, 
Um, this is kind of an interesting intersection of the two things that I'm interested that I think a lot about. Yeah, for sure. I, I will say if you're interested in pushing the political machinations that you dub and working on the funding side, doing those kind of things, um, ICA meets on Fridays from four to five. I'm not sure if that's something you can do with your work. We also work a lot um, in, in between the weeks. Um, and we have somewhat of a strategy, somewhat of a plan for things like these. I'm not going to share it all right now. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, reach out to, I think, Emma is in chat. I'm not on the Zoom, but we keep getting back to Yeah, I'll just, I'll type my email. You can reach out, but I'll, I'll return it um, to the presentation so we're not, you know, taking too much time here. No worries. Uh, okay, and, and we'll get more into, like, you know, kind of the student engagement uh, side of things um, and and what we see as being opportunities, um, uh, you know, things that we could do, uh, things that potentially you can do. Um, and frankly, you know, that's another spot where, you know, bring your ideas to the table, right? And, uh, and we can have uh, discussions around that. All right, still going through, I see green hydrogen is another future tech to consider, absolutely. Right, uh, uh, and Christoph, that speaks to the uh, electrical generation piece. If you can do that from green hydrogen, then uh, that's a, a game changer. Um, uh, all right, and then uh, Nicholas, yes, Christoph, I was wondering if the existing pipeline could be used for green hydrogen from uh, Puget Sound Energy. Maybe it could be demonstrated of green hydrogen and a good marketing opportunity. Um, maybe. Uh, the problem with pipelines and hydrogen is that hydrogen is a smaller molecule than what goes through there right now. And so uh, unless the pipes are all new, uh, it will leak. And leaking hydrogen is a little bit of a problem for people for some reason. Um, so uh, they would need to, there would be significant investment into the upgrades of the piping infrastructure required uh, in order to uh, get things like green hydrogen coming uh, a long distance away. Uh, don't mean to be putting a wet blanket over it because I, I I think it is very much at play as is you know uh, nuclear fusion. Uh, but look, uh, fugitive emissions uh, on pipelines, I think is a big issue, uh, whether it's green hydrogen or renewable natural gas and uh, would have to be considered if we were going down that path. Uh, all right. And yes, Christoph, this, yes, student task force can effectively become an advocacy group. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, all right. Back to my chart. Uh, I think we kind of talked, I mean, really, this is the same five point piece, but just highlighting uh, the funding. Oh, right. And the other part that's here is that the sewer opportunity and the lake opportunity uh, could be financed in a completely different way, uh, where the UW simply, I'll use the lake as an example, we just go to the marketplace and say, we're willing to buy cold water for the next 30 years in the same way that we buy electricity today, right? And in essence, we become the anchor tenant on the mall, be the business concept here, where, you know, we, we make it financially viable for someone to actually do this by willing to buy that cold water for the next 30 years at a certain volume from January to December. And, um, and yeah, there's, there are a lot of, you know, obviously, you know, there's the company that does this up in Toronto. We got Centrio in our own backyard in Seattle. Uh, there are other companies that this is their wheelhouse and they would be tripping over each other to provide that service and function uh, to the campus. And our only cost is the agreement to buy that cold water for the next 30 years. Uh, we don't actually have to put up any capital uh, to make that happen. Uh, same on the sewer. Uh, so, um, you know, so that's, yeah, so uh, that's, I very much see that as being an approach uh, on the delivery of those and uh, it makes a difference. Oh, we're past the time. Thanks, Antiana. Okay, right. Next slide. Um, I think we got the presentation. This is just showing the long-term effect of that $3 billion fund, green, green revolving fund that actually could build up over time. It could become $65 billion at the end of 15 years. Once again, back to the John Kennedy thing. I still thought, obviously it doesn't address the $550 billion problem, but it's one more piece, right? And we can leverage that funding against 
the IRA and leverage it against the uh, cap and trade program in the state. Um, next. Next slide. Yeah, here's what we need. UW-wide initiative and commitment. Um, so, you know, a voice from the students to say, yeah, this is what we want. Uh, this is what we want. When we go to University of Washington, this is what we expect. Uh, lots of reference to people being former uh, grads uh, earlier. I'm a former UW grad too, right? That's that's why I came back here uh, to do this, right? So, uh, but yeah, so that's that's a big one. Uh, engage partners and stakeholders. Glad you're all here. I mentioned other ones earlier. And then the financing strategy support. Uh, next. Uh, next steps, next. Uh, you know, uh, escalating our investment. So that's already started is the first part. Uh, the metering and the controls, we've already got new dollars uh, to go towards these initiatives. Uh, we're still working on getting funding on the data analytics front. Um, and uh, we're at the stage where we're trying to uh, find an energy services partner uh, who's, who's going to be with us uh, for the next 15 years and provide coordination across all of the projects kind of working, uh, it's very complex working with our procurement folks. They're not used to the idea of hiring an energy services partner for, you know, beyond a one year period. Um, so this is new, um, but um, uh, I see that as being critical. And then the other part is that to go to the next slide is we think that the start of the, uh, where we can start this is in the Southwest section of the campus uh, near where our West Campus utility plant is. And uh, uh, there's a bunch of buildings we could consolidate, cooling, bringing that waste heat back, and then have this be the starting point of the hot water loop. And the reason why this section of the campus is so key is because the campus is either going to uh, you know, move towards developments uh, to the west of where, the, yeah, yeah, to a little north of that, because those are student residences, those aren't going anywhere, but right up there. Uh, that's where new developments would happen. And, or if you go down to the sort of the Southeast section of the map further East, yep, down there, uh, you know, Magnuson Health Sciences is, is one of the biggest energy consuming buildings on the campus. It's also a seismic problem. It's also a deferred maintenance problem. So if the campus was going to sort of begin a major renewal process, it would happen here. And what we learned at UBC is you want your starting point of your hot water grid to be adjacent to wherever your new growth or your renewal strategy is going to take place. So this seems like the obvious place to start to put us in the best position, whether the campus goes west and or east. All right, next. I think that's it. Uh, and we're over time. Uh, uh, all right. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, just as a quick uh, maybe takeaway for us students who are still in the room and online, um, what I'm hearing is it sounds like the ask from us is to work with you to um, amplify the message as a unified voice coming from students towards uh, the administration and the Board of Regents. Is that, is that accurate? Aside from us being informed about what you're doing, what can we do to support you, right? Um, is, yeah. is, is that accurate? Yeah, that's accurate. You know, look, look there's, there's, there's a lot to this, right? It's uh, have your voice and be advocates. It's be informed, which you're a little more informed now with seeing this presentation. It's engage in debates, right? So all the questions that were asked, you know, were, you know, th th they're laced with their own little debates, right? We, we talked about fugitive emissions on pipelines, for example, and RNG. There's more to that debate, right? Excuse me. Like, if RNG is coming from a landfill, is it better to be used right beside, like, on a on some facility that's adjacent to the landfill, as opposed to coming on a pipeline, hundreds of miles away to us? There are so many debates on on these elements, and I think we can have a lot of these conversations. So I really I want to create a platform where students outside of this can learn, read, find out about stuff and then come back to here and say, hey, Dave, I was reading about this. What do you know about this? And maybe I'll have an answer because uh, maybe I do know about it or maybe I won't. And I'll be like, you know what? That's actually a really good idea. And we can shape the strategy, right? It's not, I haven't laid out the perfect plan that says, 
this is what pipe goes to this building, and this is the answer that happens here. I've laid out a, a strategy that will get us there, and that there are opportunities for um, uh, you know, a sophistication or optimization uh, on those uh, five elements. And I, you know, what I, I what I hate to have happen is students not know what we were doing and then come to us four years from now when, you know, outside of the final 20%, it is too late and say, hey, I have got this really good idea. Um, what do you think about it? And be like, yeah, uh, you know, window missed. Right. Um, so really trying to create a platform at the beginning uh, to uh, allow those those good ideas uh, to come forward. And uh, what's, the, what's the quote? One of my favorite quotes is uh, 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 none of us is as smart as all of us. Something like that. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, but advocacy is the starting point. Um, Uh, other questions? Uh, so David, so what is the uh, strategy to keep this conversation going? Do you expect to have like a meeting every month or like have a Google Doc where we can put our ideas? Mm. Uh, great question. So, you know, there, there's a bit of, uh, we're building this as we go. As I mentioned, I didn't have the greatest student engagement strategy when I was at UBC. So it's not like I'm, mirroring what I previously did and say, you know, this is the answer and this is what, what works. I, I think the element we, we did, we have done the faculty task force meeting and it's been, it's been great. It's been really engaging. And so the element was, well, how can we have it with staff and faculty, not with students? We've got to get this one going. Uh, so I think our plan is, uh, is it uh, Maryland? I think we're once every two months to begin with. Um, part of that, the idea around that cycle is I actually need to do stuff in between. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just coming here and giving you an update of uh, uh, what you've already heard. Uh, uh, and I, that is one of my challenges is uh, I've given this presentation a lot, which is good, because and that's it's fine at the moment because I'm I'm in that you know building momentum standpoint like. One of the things that we also did, sorry for the tangent, is um, we're doing these decarbonization tours of the steam plant. Uh, but it's not just, it's a tour of the existing plant, but then we've set up one of the rooms with a bunch of posters with a lot of the information that you just saw on the on the PowerPoint uh, there. And a lot of things I spoke to about the salmon and the sewer, we have those in posters up around the room. And we're using that as a way the original intent was to send invites out to the senior executives of the university so that they could become more informed on the background in the same way that you are now. Uh, but then they also got to walk through the plant and they got to see how old everything was. They got to see how big everything was. We actually took them down into the tunnel. You know, they got to feel the heat that's coming off the steam lines when you're in the tunnel. And uh, so it's been a fantastic way of engaging them. It is change the conversation that we've been having in the last two months. The uh, person in charge, the VP of External Affairs, got so excited by the tour that he turned around and invited uh, the governor's office and a bunch of legislators that are on the uh, uh, climate uh, uh, committee, and they came on the tour. Uh, and uh, and I think we've got the Dean of the College of the Built Environment coming on a tour uh, this week. And uh, we went and presented in front of the Board of Regents two weeks ago, and we invited the Board of Regents to come on a tour. And we have the Chairman of the Board of Regents and the Chair of the Finance Committee on the Board of Regents coming out to do the tours. And why this is significant, as I know people are dropping off, is that typically when you present in front of senior folks, you got about five minutes, maybe three minutes to give your pitch. When you do a tour, you got 90 minutes. Now, you still have to be focused on themes of what you're wanting them to remember. You can't just talk for an hour and a half, but it's it's already made a difference already. And it, this is something that I did up at UBC and was successful up there that we've tried to recreate down here. Um, so, um, I'm not sure quite what I got on this tangent, but um, 
like uh, it's just there's there's um, there's multiple ways and reasons of why you would engage and engage in different ways. Tatiana, you waited patiently with your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to add some more context and uh, thank everyone for coming today. Um, I'm with the Campus Sustainability Fund and we helped organize this event with the UW Sustainability Office. And a large part of our motivation was just today, as you know, is more of an informational meeting and making sure that we all had a working baseline of what we're talking about. And so, um, yeah, we'll be having um, bi-monthly meetings with Dave, but then also I think CSF and then Christoph from UW Sustainability, we've been organizing this together. And so we're open to like a monthly meeting with students if they want to, uh, you know, we can get together and we can organize. And our hope was in bringing representatives from other student groups across campus that are already engaging in this work. We can kind of work in parallel to one another after we break and then come together and hopefully have some more robust uh, discussions. Um, and I put down a feedback form. Um, so if you have any kind of thoughts uh, for how the meeting went today and then any sort of changes you'd like to see, um, that's a good idea for Google form or, or sorry, for like a Google doc where we can kind of type some of our ideas out. Um, but yeah, we'll be reaching out probably after finals. I don't want to say that we're going to do anything before finals happen, uh, but some details when we're going to be meeting up next. Um, but I, I would say in the meantime, like review all of the concepts that we've talked about and maybe start thinking of ideas because uh, we can really engage in whatever capacity we decide that we're able to. And so that's, that's really what our hope is, is just trying to figure out, um, you know, what the problem is and then uh, be able to figure out solutions for us and then think about engagement for other students as well. Also, you put the link for the uh, for tours of the state plan. Yes, yeah, well. so we're also um, gathering a list. Students haven't been down there yet. And so we're gonna, we're planning to go down in the winter. So if you wanna go check it out, um, yeah, sign up and then we'll find a time. You just need the time, so it's, it's free. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, another tour for you, Dave. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And like our our plan on the tours was to continue to expand it out. So, uh, you know, not just folks like students, uh, but also uh, faculty that are, are, are interested. I mean, we're still getting some of the deans to come on the tours as well. Um, and we also want to reach out to some of our partners. And, and we are. So the folks at Office of Sustainability at the City of Seattle and commerce and ecology with the state uh, because honestly even you know uh, whether they're rule makers or you know like their ability to see the scale and the scope of what we're doing there, there's nothing that else that exists at the scale of the university of washington steam plant and the state of washington yet there are many steam systems and so the point being that we can demonstrate what's possible here and solve this here it actually can go a long way to helping inform uh, other agencies and not just universities but hospitals uh, and prisons who do prisons have steam systems apparently uh, yeah, and, Seattle you know, has a district right. steam that's system. right that's right they got the centrio privacy so and the and the interesting thing about our context Christoph is that um, you know we're kind of like a small city on the campus other than we happen to own all the buildings. So we don't have the same sort of policy challenges that Centrio might have of trying to negotiate with all of its customers. But that basically means that we can get to a better answer faster uh, that can help inform uh, groups like, like them. Uh, all right. Uh, thanks, everybody. Sorry for going over, uh, but they were great questions that you asked, and I look forward to continuing the engagement. And uh, like I say, I, I learned from you based on the questions that we ask. And, um, and Tatiana, your comments were fantastic. Um, probably should have gone to that uh, right when uh, the question was asked uh, around what the format of this is looking for. And I guess the, the only part I would say is, is we're, we're open. Uh, I'm open uh, to what this engagement can look like. And, and having this type of forum is just one piece. Uh, there's other things that we can do as well. And I'm sure that you can bring ideas uh, to that place. You know, one of the things, uh, John Kennedy, we were talking about uh, a couple of months back about this idea of short snippet videos uh, on a website that helps tell the story um, uh, of what we're trying to do. Um, 
you know, as opposed to paying for some speaking for an hour, right? And, uh, you know, I, I very much see something like that being uh, in our future uh, to make it easier for, you know, people that can't uh, go on the tour, that, you know, the plant's not the most accessible, or well, it isn't the most, it isn't accessible at all uh, place. And so that's a little problematic and we haven't squared that yet of how do we give a tour or share the same information with someone who can't go up those ladders and stairs inside the plant. Um, all right, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, till we meet again, and uh, I did see in the chat there was reference to uh, event Wednesday night. Uh, I signed up, so I'll see some of you uh, there. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, who can I stop?